Okay, so we will go to chapter six from the book of John. So welcome once again, everyone. We will continue. I think we um, have completed till chapter five. So chapter six is what we need to look at today. Um, would like to request uh, somebody to please pray and then we will go forward. So one of us, please lead in prayer. Please. Okay, Dave, could you please lead us? Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this wonderful and beautiful day, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are so wonderful and we thank you that you are you have been so um, faithful to us, Lord Jesus, to give us this mm -hmm. time and this opportunity to be in this class, Lord Jesus, as we learn from your word, Lord Jesus. I pray that your word may speak to each one of us, Lord Jesus, as we are joining in our classes, Lord God, let there be no any hindrances, but let each one of us learn from your word the way you want us to learn, Lord Jesus, and help each one, each one of us to understand completely, Lord Jesus, so that we can use your word when we need to, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Let your spirit be with our uh, Nancy and let your spirit be with each one of us, those who are joining, which is in the class. I pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dave. Okay, so let's get into uh, today's chapter, chapter 6. So here we will see a couple of things uh, so far. Jesus has done miracles. We saw in the last uh, chapter, chapter 5, how he heals the man at the pool of Bethsaida uh, and how people, because of their religious spirit, their questions were such that they uh, did not question how marvelous uh, you know, they did not have questions in awe of God, but rather they had questions to, uh, you know, keep up their traditions and their rituals. So we saw how the religious spirit interfered uh, with their trust in God. Then, you know, we went on to see that Jesus encourages them. He tells them, come on, you need to put your faith. If you, Even if you don't believe the words that I'm speaking, put your trust in what you are seeing. Okay, and he had just healed a man who was paralyzed for 38 years. But we see the hard-heartedness of the people. Okay, so that's that's what we uh, observed so far. Now let's see, you know, what uh, Jesus is up to in chapter six. So John is recording you know, all of these incidents in Jesus's life, and if you recall in the epistles of John, we saw how he says that whatever we have seen, whatever we have, uh, um, you know, felt, we have, we have touched, we have observed. So he is writing as an eyewitness for the people to understand that these are the events that took place. This is the manner in which the Lord Jesus uh, lived his life with power, blessing the people, moving about in the supernatural, uh, you know, the power of God. So. These are eyewitness accounts, okay? And it's meant to help us put our trust in who the Lord Jesus is as the word of God, uh, as the son of God. So let's continue. So we are here at uh, John chapter six. And here we see that after whatever uh, we have seen in chapter five, uh, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee. Okay, uh, And over here, a great multitude followed him because they had seen the signs which he had performed on those who were diseased. So that is, uh, you know, a typical thing of the people. They just follow wherever they observe uh, miracles, wherever they observe, uh, uh, you know, the works of God. They follow because each one wants to receive from it. And we had uh, seen the healing in the previous chapter. So the people are following him wherever he's going. So he goes to the Sea of Galilee. People are also following him. 
and he goes up to the mountain and he sat with his disciples it says now what happened is uh, jesus even though we don't read that he was ministering to the crowds teaching them and things like that it's probable that he was spending time with the crowds he was uh, you know imparting put into their hearts maybe about the kingdom of god which was his common theme that he preached at all times he was speaking to them and imparting into them and as a leader okay someone who is uh, serving the people spiritually it's only natural for that leader to think of the physical needs of the people so here we look at uh, jesus and it says verse 5 he lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him he said to philip so jesus is not just concerned about the spiritual fulfillment of the people but as a human being he understood the people had been with him long so they must have been hungry by that point in time and it is probable that the place where they were food was not available and that is why he calls out to philip and it is likely that it was philip's area you know that region uh, maybe among all the disciples philip was the one who was uh, uh, who knew things about that particular place so he asks philip where shall we buy bread that these may eat so jesus is concerned even about the natural needs of the people you can just imagine you know what a what a mighty uh, god we serve he is concerned about all things uh, otherwise jesus could have just said okay may the lord bless you and keep you go you know do your own thing but in this particular situation looks like the people had been with jesus listening to him uh, and his heart was moved with compassion for their physical need which is the need for food so he tries to uh, um, figure out whether he and the disciples can provide so that's why he's asking philip okay now as the son of god uh, we know that he was fully man but you know jesus had faith right jesus had uh, uh, he also moved with the power of the holy spirit so he knew what is possible and what is probable in this kind of a situation so we see here in verse 6 we are told that he was only testing the disciples till now they had seen what jesus could do so he was wondering whether they will have the same kind of faith which he is carrying uh, if they would just jump up and say that oh jesus we know that you can provide uh, you know it's not a problem uh, if we don't find food around here but we see that that was not the response which he got from the disciples especially philip so what does philip say you know like any one of us who uh, are uh, uh, you know uh, logical and rational people uh, we will do a calculation and we will say okay how many people are there okay 200 people if 200 people are there and they have to be fed lunch okay, a uh, basic lunch will cost something like 80 rupees okay so let's do the calculation you know 18 to 200 okay jesus this is how much you know uh, uh, it's going to cost so how are, how are we going to uh, get this money how are we going to take care of the people so philip went into that mode as a logical individual he says 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them now it's also uh, a fact that philip was referring to the amount which they had so there was a limit so imagine if we have uh, you know a, a certain amount of money uh, we would say okay 1600 uh, okay fine you know it's possible we can feed the people uh, uh, but what if what if you know there was very little money with us then we would look at the money in our hands and say hey, come on you know whatever uh, i just have 500 rupees how can i even think of providing for these people so basically he's just doing his calculation and figuring out that it's not possible it's not sufficient the money which they had so among the disciples it seems like andrew 
uh, I don't know what he thought of Jesus, but he said, you know what, Jesus, there is one boy here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Now, we don't understand what Andrew was thinking. Now, maybe he had the faith that with something little, Jesus can multiply and make much more out of it. But Andrew tells Jesus about this uh, meal that a small boy had. And those days, barley loaves, okay, these are small cakes made out of barley. Uh, and people who were very poor, they were the ones who would have, you know, things like they would eat barley and it was not considered, uh, uh, you know, very sort of a rich food, something very, very basic. So this boy had a basic lunch with him. Now, Jesus understood that he has found the little which he needs to multiply. Okay. And it's like, uh, uh, you know, in this situation, we can judge the disciples and say, how come they didn't have faith? Jesus was with them. They could have believed that their needs would be met. But Philip was calculating. Andrew, he saw to, he seemed to have faith to tell Jesus, ah, there is a there is a boy with lunch. But then he he thinks, ah, it's too Jesus can do something about it, but even that is too little. I wish there was something more that we could offer Jesus to multiply. Jesus, taking all these things into account, uh, he's also a very orderly person. So he tells the, the people to sit down okay, on the grass which is available. Uh, now, in the way Jesus used to work, you, know, you can see he's very clear. Okay, this is how I'm going to do it. This is how we'll do it in an orderly fashion. Make the people sit down. So just the men alone who sat down, we read that there were 5,000 of them. It's a huge situation. Huge, huge, huge. How is the food going to come for them? And you see what Jesus did. He takes those barley loaves, which are a tiny uh, provision at that point, And it says that he gave thanks. And that was Jesus' practice at all times. He gave thanks. So again, he gives thanks uh, with the food that he has. And what does he do? You know, he distributes. He breaks the bread. He distributes them to the disciples who are uh, disciples to give it to the people who are sitting down. So they go ahead and they distribute it off. And what we see is when the people are filled, in fact, excess food, so fragments that remain, they were also collected. So, you know, the work is done in such an organized way. Uh, and you see the miracle of God where the people are provided for. What do we understand when we uh, see that there is remaining fragments? God, as he gave the covenant name of Jehovah Jireh to his people, you know, he is a God who can provide uh, fully. He can provide until we are satisfied. So when do we leave um, excess food during our meals? Generally, when we are full. And in this case, the disciples picked up extra fragments. So that shows us that God was able to multiply the food. A miracle of multiplication was, was uh, uh, possible to the extent that the people were completely satisfied. And 12 baskets, it says, at those days, these baskets, uh, you know, the theologians say these were huge. These were big baskets. They were not just, you know, some random small baskets in which you collected uh, uh, thing, but for for uh, carrying fish generally to uh, store fish, they had huge baskets, and those were probably the kind of baskets which were being used to gather the 
uh, remaining food. So Jesus did this as a sign and a wonder. And he met the needs of the people. Now, when people observed this, what did they say? We are told that now they are telling Jesus, verse 14, truly the prophet who has come into the world. Earlier, when he healed the, uh, the lame man, there were questions. Uh, some believed, but not everyone believed. But in this situation, when people's hunger is satisfied, when their need is met, they are ready to say that this is a prophet. They probably related this to the way the children of Israel were led through the wilderness. You remember, God provided manna from heaven when they were hungry. So, similar to that, they see Jesus is giving them, you know, it's, it's like manna, right? Uh, supernatural. And I don't know if the people realized. People were watching and they, they just knew that this is supernatural. How is it that this man and his disciples are able to provide food for so many people? So they knew it was supernatural and they decided that this person, he's not normal. He seems to be somebody like Moses. So he is a prophet who has come into the world. So this is a sign that Jesus performed. Now, when the people saw that Jesus is able to do these miracles, they thought that they found a representative uh, whom they can appoint as a leader. Uh, and, you know, they uh, probably had grievances against the Roman government at that time. So they thought, okay, if we have a leader who is strong and somebody who can do signs like this, we can overthrow the government. So they looked at Jesus and they wanted to force him to become a king. But, you know, it says, scripture says in verse 15, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Okay, so, you know, earlier we saw how Jesus did not take the praises of the people. So he did not live for the uh, applause and the appreciation of the people. Instead, he wanted to live for the father and the appreciation of the father because doing the works of the father is what gave him that satisfaction and fulfillment. Now, when the people are excited and they want to make him king, you know, if it was you and me, we would have been very uh, happy that we are getting an opportunity, uh, we are getting a position uh, where, you know, we will be well respected and all of that. But Jesus was not at all impressed by the, uh, the appreciation that the people were showering on him. Instead, we read here that he departed to the mountain. Okay, so what does this tell us about Jesus? You know, spending time in popularity and in fame. That should not be the driving force for us as God's people. Jesus' driving force was the presence of the Father. So he chose, you know, popularity was available, opportunity was available, and in the quietness, okay, of, of him and the Father, the presence of the Father, the words of the Father was also available to him. So Jesus was quite clear. He said, look, I don't, I'm not doing this for popularity. I'm not doing this for position, but I want the Father. I want to know the Father's heart. So we read here, verse 15, that he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. So why is he departing alone by himself? Any idea? Have you seen Jesus do this earlier? And why is he going alone?
Okay, any thoughts? I'm sure you already know. Okay. Tamil says to spend time with the father. Okay, good. What about the others? Okay, are you all there, class? Yes, ma'am, here, here. <laughs> okay, okay. So, why do you think he went alone? No, it's clear, uh, it's easily, uh, we can understand. We're getting that what you're. Yeah, but, but still, I'm asking like, uh, he could have taken the disciples with him, but why is it that he's going alone? He's spending a time alone with the Father to pray. Okay. Even we have a gathering prayer also. We need a, you know, a intimate personal relationship with the Father that shows uh, the lifestyle of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, true, true, uh, Thomas. So, you know, uh, what I want us to see here is the fact that, see, there Jesus is doing all these miracles. And, uh, you know, he... Um, you know, he he wants he wants to serve God, fulfill his purpose. But he realizes that the source is in the presence of the Father. He never compromised on that alone time with the Father, even the disciples, right? He never even took the disciples with him because that private time with God was the empowering time uh, that he needed. Uh, and, and so he he never he he kind of uh, doesn't think about it. He just makes that a priority. The crowds don't matter. The disciples don't matter anymore. You know, no other task matters. But he figures out a place where he can be alone with God, and he goes and he spends time. Now this is very very important. Okay, this is very important even for us. And I think it was your batch. I'm not able to recall. Uh, but I talked about uh, burnout. Isn't it? Was it your batch? Uh, but I said that, oh yeah, correct, your batch. When we studied Acts 13, uh, and we said that the people were ministering unto God. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Ministering unto God is the place of power. It's the place of strength. It's the place where we we uh, commune with the Father closely. And Jesus knew the value of that. So just look at this. You know, it's kingdom perspective. If we don't have kingdom perspective, if we don't have spiritual perspective, we will look at the world uh, around us. And especially, you know, because you're all uh, for ministry and you will be serving God in one way or the other, the 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 world, its appreciation, the crowds and the fame, you know, all these things can actually get to us if we are not careful. But in the life of Jesus, you know, we realize that he knew the value of ministering to God. And so he's not worried about anything, anyone. He just departs again to the mountain by himself. Okay. And that is valuable. And each one of us as ministers of God, we have to make it a priority. I've heard somebody say this, uh, come apart, else you will come apart. Okay, uh, I might take a moment for you to get that. I'll put it in the chat here. Okay, so that is uh, an encouragement to spend time with God. Moving on, when evening had come, so Jesus went, he did what he needed to do, the main thing, just spending time with God, and evening time, he's coming back. So it's not like he's abandoning the disciples, but the disciples probably knew that this is the pattern. Jesus' daily schedule looks like this. Okay, great. Now, evening, uh, the disciples, they went down to the sea. We know that some of them were fishermen, so they were familiar with the sea. They got into a boat and went towards Capernaum. And it was already dark. Okay, uh, And at this time, uh, they don't have Jesus in the boat. You know, Earlier once when they had a stop, Jesus was very much in the boat. But this time, Jesus is not in the boat. But there is a stop. Apparently, the Sea of Galilee 
was a place where uh, you know storms could break out suddenly so the disciples were familiar with it and they i don't know whether they got scared or or you know they were uh, calm at that time but one thing disturbed them they suddenly saw uh, jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat and that made them afraid you can imagine it's a stormy time uh, it's already scary and then there is somebody approaching you who's walking on the water but when they were afraid right uh, uh, the the supernatural uh, sort of an event unfold before them jesus comforts them and he tells them it is i do not be afraid that they willingly received him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going so jesus got back and he joined them you know for for the rest of the the schedule uh, but the way he did it i think at every point the disciples are understanding that something about this person is you know different he is demonstrating the supernatural power of god at all times now if you and i had the opportunity to see jesus come on the water what do you think that would do to us what would it do to you how would it affect you yeah it's okay kiran okay would your faith rise or not um means by seeing jesus walking on the water yeah, water. yeah correct right uh, faith will increase of course so that's what i'm thinking you know that being with jesus and you know being with jesus for like about 3 three, three and a half year and seeing all these things how is it that the disciples when he was uh, uh being crucified they denied him you know and and uh, they did not really sat up for the faith uh but you know i'm just thinking to myself all these supernatural events reveal to you that wow this jesus there's something amazing about him he is also able to in this case it's like your own natural laws you remember in the the old testament uh, read about uh, where tax starts floating right tax starts floating that is not natural because the axe is supposed to sink and can't hear anything lag is there
Okay, sorry about that class. My one internet connection failed. So I joined with the other one. It should be okay. So yeah, I was just saying that, you know, uh, this miracle overrides natural law and is, is can God's miracles override natural law? They can. But uh, it does not happen every day. So we don't read that, you know, Jesus walked on the water every day and got back to the disciples. So we can't, uh, uh, you know, tell God that God, you know, you, the natural things are there. Like just for example, you know, I jokingly say every day we have to clean our home. Okay. But uh, supernaturally, can we expect that everything will go back in its own place and arrange itself? I don't know, maybe it can happen once or, I, you know, if, if at all God thinks it's necessary, a miracle like that can happen. But otherwise, the normal process is the natural process. So every day we have to clean, every day we have to organize. Uh, so in this case, you know, we are observing that Jesus was also able to override natural laws. Now, when people are seeing all these things, their faith you know, must have been rising. What about the outsiders? They also were encouraged, uh, uh, you know, to, to kind of see these miracles, which they had not seen other people do. Especially the miracle of providing food uh, was, was something that the people were very impressed with. So now what happens is the people who had experienced the miracle of the breaking of bread, they started following Jesus. Okay? The, the disciples and Jesus, they had already moved away. Now, these people, they came in search of Jesus and the disciples so that uh, they could be with Jesus. So they come to him and they say, they find him on the other side of the sea and they say, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus, he understands. So what? Why are these people? See, there's always the motivation of the heart, you know, which is very, very important. So Jesus realizes these people are not here to put their faith and trust in me. But they are the kind of people who only want the benefits of the power of God. So Jesus answers them and he tells them, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and the fill. Okay, how unfortunate. The people, they are uh, not uh, receiving the deeper things. Okay, the deeper spiritual things. But just a little bit to satisfy their physical longing is sufficient for them. And they are not willing to pay the price to follow Jesus. Then Jesus tells them, come on, don't live for this world. So he goes about sharing this truth with them. He says, don't labor for the food which perishes. Meaning, this world is temporary. You are following me because of the food? But you know what? It's temporary. The things of this world are temporary. But he says, but you must labor for the food which endures to everlasting life. So he's saying that, you know, there are greater things in the kingdom of God. So look for those things. And then he says, the son of man will give you because God the father has sent his seal on, set his seal on him. So one more thing we realize here is, first of all, he's directing their attention to spiritual things. And he's saying, you feel that the miracle of breaking the bread is what confirms the son of God as the son of God. But actually, yes, the miracles testify uh, of who he is. But more than that, the father has set the seal on him. Meaning, the father himself has approved him. And that is the greatest reason why one must put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So not just for the uh, temporary earthly things. Then they ask him, okay, Jesus, fine. You know, you're talking about all these spiritual things. Now you tell us, what shall we do to work the works of God? And Jesus tells them, look, the works of God, right? If you want to really do God's work, what is it that God is calling us to uh, step out with? It's always faith. 
So God is looking for a life of faith. So Jesus tells them, this is the work of God that you believe, that you believe in him who, who he sent. So if you want to please God, uh, it starts with faith. And it starts with putting our faith in the son of God himself. So Jesus is inviting the people to put their trust in him as the son of God, because the father himself has sent him. So basically he's saying, you know, be born again. Remember, he spoke to Nicodemus. What did he want? He wanted Nicodemus to be born again. And every other miracle that he did, he wanted people to believe in him. The woman at the well, what was the ultimate result? Put her faith in Jesus and all the people in Samaria to put their faith in Jesus. So again, he's inviting these people and he's saying, don't live for the miracles, but put your faith in God. That is what is important. Then look at the attitude of the people. You know, it's so uh, rigid. We saw the religious spirit. Now, these people, when he's saying, believe in me, they're asking him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? It's actually quite funny because just uh, now Jesus had done the miracle of breaking the bread, you know, the, the previous day. And that is not sufficient. Again, they are asking for another sign. So among the Jews, they had this uh, common way of uh, uh, looking at spiritual things. They used to look for signs. Right? They used to look for signs, wonders. So that's exactly how they are responding to Jesus again. And they're saying, okay, show us one more miracle you show us. What, what will you do? You know, uh, In the uh, desert, we know that God provided manna and he did a miracle. Now, basically what they wanted is their needs should be met. Yesterday, Jesus gave food. Today also let him give food. Tomorrow let him give food. You know, we are happy with that. So they were in that mode and they thought that if they question Jesus like this, their physical needs will be met. But look at Jesus. He says, still you people have a worldly way of thinking. I'm calling you to think about spiritual things. Don't live for the food of this world. He's telling them there's another world. There's another kingdom, a spiritual kingdom of God. Think about that kingdom. That is more important. But again, their question is a natural question. So Jesus says, look, most assuredly, Moses, he did not give you the bread from heaven, but who gave it? My father. Okay. He is the one who is able to give you the true bread from heaven. So you're talking about a miracle that took place through Moses. First of all, it was not Moses. Who gave you that food. Now, the second thing is, why are you running after a food that will perish? How about, you know, I give you something that will last forever. So he's saying, true bread, true bread from heaven. You know, it's like, uh, uh, suppose you, you are hung, you're thirsty and uh, there is a water source close by where you can get fresh clean drinking water uh, and I give you a glass of water okay and if you keep on asking me I want some more water I want some more water better than giving you the you know a glass of water I can just show you the source of water and say this will last for a long time why don't you drink from the source itself so Jesus is drawing them to the spiritual source who is he himself, the son of God, who is the true bread from heaven. So he's introducing himself and he's saying that this bread is what you actually need. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So now he's moving the conversation from the natural food to the spiritual food, which is the Lord Jesus. And he says that he is that bread which the people actually need. So, you know, looking at the people, Jesus sees their physical need, but 
he knows that the greatest need which they have is their spiritual need so he directs them to himself and he says come on why don't you uh, eat of me because i will satisfy you and then he goes on to describing himself he says i am the bread of life he who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst so he saying that he is that eternal source of satisfaction he is the eternal source of fulfillment okay he is the eternal source of nourishment so why look for earthly bread you depend on me then again he calls them to believe he says that you know uh, uh, it's me that you must put your faith in all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me i will by no means cast out so he said you come to me you receive me and i will not you know leave you out and also he uses a, a way of speaking where he says the father that you come to me through the father okay for i have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me and you know basically like when you read this passage i won't read the entire thing you can go back and uh, read it so he is saying that in him there is eternal life and the people can have eternal life so he is talking about a life which is greater than this normal natural life that the people are living and he also says that the father is the one who draws people okay to receive the eternal life now by this we must not confuse uh, and and think that you know the the concept of predestination where it's only god who decides or chooses the people who will have salvation it's not like that you know salvation is open to everyone even though scriptures say that you know the father will bring or the father will draw people to him uh, it's also the response of the people the invitation is open to everyone but the people who make the choice are the ones who are able to receive salvation and experience this everlasting life that jesus is introducing and through whom do we have eternal life everlasting life we have it only through the son of god and the way he spoke to nicodemus you know he speaks about himself and he is calling the people to come to himself then what happens when jesus is sharing and inviting people to himself we are told that the jews complained about him because he said i am the bread which came down from heaven see they are unable to receive spiritual truth okay that is the challenge with the jews so when jesus is making such a beautiful offer they are rejecting it and they are equating jesus based on their natural information and they say this is jesus he is just the son of joseph and why is he saying that he has come down from heaven they were also concerned that jesus is equating himself with god right he's ca- calling god as father he uh, now he is saying he has come down from heaven he is the bread who has come down from heaven so these were all things that they could not accept okay. moving forward again he explains himself more as the bread of life and he he says was 48 he says i am the bread of life this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die so is jesus threatened because the people are not accepting that he is the bread of life not at all he sticks to the truth and he continues to reveal the truth and tells the people i am the bread of life you know you are thrilled about the food which moses gave in the wilderness but the people who ate of it you know they died but i am telling you that i have come down from heaven i am the bread of life if you eat me then you will live forever okay? so he is offering them salvation and even at this point you know when he says if you eat me or he uses the term in verse 51 eat my flesh and the jews did not like it they did not like the fact that he was inviting them to consume for himself so 
Jesus makes statements like verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. So Jesus continues to reveal to them that he is, you know, that Passover lamb who has come to fulfill the purpose of the father. And what does it mean? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. He's talking about the work which is going to do on the cross shortly. Okay. And he's inviting the people to salvation. And those who receive salvation, he reveals to them that there is going to be resurrection. I will raise him up. Right? Raise him up. Talking about resurrection. So the Lord Jesus is inviting the people to trust him and put their faith in him because he is the eternal source. He is the very bread of life. So when Jesus is turning the hearts of the people from natural aspects to the spiritual aspects, what happens? You know, we expect that people will respond positively. But how unfortunate. Verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? So, because they could not receive what Jesus was saying, there were people of his own disciples who left him. Okay? And it's nothing new. You know, today, we might find similar crowds of people who are not able to receive what God's word is speaking to their hearts and they turn away. But it happened even to Jesus. These people left him and they said, we cannot follow this man. He's asking us to put our faith in things which is very difficult for us. We just want normal, you know, do miracles, feed us, tell us something easy to do. We manage with that. But his teachings are hard. So at this point, let's just go for a break. We will come back and cover the remaining uh, things that take place and the teachings that Jesus uh, imparts to the people around him. Okay. So 10 minutes from now, it's 9.50. Let's come back at 10 o'clock and we will continue. Thank you.